So, we'll come, we've come to the end of the sermon series. Uh, we've been looking all throughout summer at the values of Harbor Church, who we say we are when we say we're God's children, who we say we are. And I've realized um, I've ended up closing the last three sermon series that we've been doing. So, I, you know, uh, yeah, I'm Harbor Church's closer. That's, that's, that's good. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, but so we've been looking at uh, what it means when we say that we're Harbor Church. And we've explored a little bit. Last week we talked about how when we say we're Harbor Church, we believe that, we, that there's a sovereign God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who rules over us who has given us salvation. That's the central value that brings us together. We've also talked about how we are a church that believes in prayer. We believe in that God is a God who listens to us, and so we cry out to Him. We've talked about how um, we are a church that's rooted in the Word of God, and we believe that it's an authority in our lives. And most importantly, we've spent a lot of weeks talking about how when we look at scripture, when we look at what God has planned for us, that God's call for all of our lives is to go out into the ends of the earth and proclaim His salvation, proclaim His truth, and proclaim His glory to the world. So I, was, so I kind of felt like, well, we covered everything, so now what am I supposed to do? Um, <laughs> um, but I came to this passage, and I think that's just maybe one last um, epilogue value that should we take, that we should listen to as we go into the fall and we go into what else God has in store for us. So if you have your Bibles, turn to me to 1 Corinthians 12, um, verse 4. And actually, while I'm doing that, let me be a good person and turn off my cell phone. <laughs> I just realized it was on. <laughs> Um, yes. So 1 Corinthians 12. And if you have Bibles, you can read along with me. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them, and in every one, it is the same God at work. Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one that is given the Spirit through that's given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another faith. To another gifts of healing. To another miraculous powers. To another prophecy. To another distinguishing between spirits. To another speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of the one and the same Spirit. And He distributes them to each one of us, just as He determines. For just as a body, though, many has, though one has many parts, but all its parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one Spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one Spirit to drink. So the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Will you pray with me? So Lord, as we explore your word today, will you first let your Holy Spirit descend upon me and speak through me, so that what I say may be truthful and may impact us. We pray you open our ears and our eyes and our hearts, so that we'll be ready to hear what you have to say to us. Speak through me, in me, and especially in spite of me. And we pray all this in your mighty name. Amen. So as I was thinking of what value we may have missed out, I came up with this. I think when we say that we are Harbor Church, I think one of our values is that we say that we are a charismatic church. Now, don't get too panicky. I mean, I grew up... Pentecostal, I grew up in Assemblies of God, and um, when I say we're a charismatic church, that's not necessarily what I mean, so calm down, but I sincerely believe that one of the things 
one of the central values of Harbor Church is that we're a charismatic church and that we believe that God has sent the Holy Spirit to dwell amongst us. That God has sent the Holy Spirit to be our comfort, our guide, and our aid. That God has sent the Holy Spirit to build up the church to be a witness to the world. And we believe, as is written in this passage, that the Holy Spirit has poured out into each and every one of us spiritual gifts to build up the church, to be witnesses to the world. So how do I know? Um, when I say gifts of the Spirit, you know, what does that mean? And when I grew up hearing about you know, the gifts of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit and all that stuff, I really sincerely wasn't sure how I was supposed to get them. And so um, when I was young, I really had what I call lightning bolt theology. I s believed that you know, God, when He speaks to us or when He does anything with us, it has to happen in some sort of supernatural way. So when I saw the gifts of the Spirit, I thought the way I was supposed to get the gifts was, you know, I had to really get down on my knees, pray all night long, you know, give me this gift, God, give me this gift, please. And I'll go to sleep one night without having it and wake up and suddenly, kapow, guess what? I can heal, baby. So, <laughs> so come and get healed, you know. I really thought that was how God worked. You know, because sometimes in the Bible it's true, it does happen that, you know, before that person could not um, heal, but suddenly God empowered them and they could heal. So that does happen, but I, I used to think that that was the only way God worked. And the problem with lightning bolt theology, at least as I formulated it in my head, was I believe that, okay, so if God is going to zap me someday and then I will get power, I'm free to wait for that day to happen. And I can just sit idly by and just keep praying, you know, God give me this gift, God give me this gift, and not do anything about it. But as I read this passage in 1 Corinthians 12, I realized I really don't think God operates on lightning bolt theology. He does once in a very rare time, but more often than not, if you read in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4 to 6, you know, I'll read it again. These are, there are different kinds of spirit, but the same spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, the same God is at work. I really think that when God says that He's given us spiritual gifts, He has already given us these gifts. Our, the clues to what our gifts and what our callings are lie in who God has already made us to be. Our talents, our passions, our knowledge, our interests, our skills, these, if we look at these things, that's how we'll know what gifts God has given us. If we find ourselves somehow in education, teaching children, teaching adults, guess what? That means God has given you that gift of teaching. If, we, if you find yourself in a place where you're in medicine and you're healing and you're with people who are sick and dying, guess what? God has given you that gift of healing. If you're passionate about caring for others, if you're passionate about defending them, God has given you that gift of compassion. He's given you that gift of prophetic justice. If your friends always comment about how you seem to believe everything's going to turn out all right, that could be the seeds of God's gift of faith in you. I sincerely believe that the gifts of the Holy Spirit aren't something that comes from outside of us, but it's something that's inbred into our DNA. God has given it to us. And all of us have these gifts. There's no such thing as an ungifted person in this congregation. There's no such thing as a person who is left out because the Holy Spirit is generous. The Holy Spirit is indiscriminate. He has poured out His Spirit on all flesh. So that's why I say we're charismatic because we believe this Holy Spirit has given us these gifts. But I've heard countless sermons about, about spiritual gifts. I've heard countless spirit sermons and talks and you know, videos and lectures about the spiritual gifts and how we're supposed to get them. So by this point, I think, and I'm pretty sure all of us have heard something along those lines. So by this point, I'm going to assume we're all experts to how we're supposed to find our spiritual gifts. 
But all this knowledge of the Holy Spirit and all this knowledge about His gifts and how they're supposed to benefit us, it's not translated to a church that's stepping forward in faith as a powerful witness unto the world. And I've always wondered why. We know about the spiritual gifts. We know that the Holy Spirit has empowered us. And yet the church still seems to stall. And I think it's because just as we're experts in finding out what spiritual gifts are and how the Holy Spirit works within us, we're also experts in figuring out how not to use them. You've become experts in stifling the Holy Spirit and His work. And I think we do so by saying no. And we do it, and we say no in three ways, and that's what I'm going to talk about this morning. We stifle the work of the Holy Spirit by saying no. First, by saying no to ourselves. I think often we feel that when it comes to the church, when it comes to working for God, that we're not good enough. We are experts in playing down our abilities. We're experts in highlighting our own inadequacies, of finding any excuse to disqualify ourselves for any ministry and service. And I'm saying we are all, like, I'm included. I remember there was this, um, I got to know a youth leader in the UK called Mike Pilavachi. Um, and his claim to fame that he, that was that he was the youth leader when a young Matt Redman walked into his um, youth service and was part of his congregation. Um, and if you, know, if you don't know who Matt Redman is, he's this great um, current worship leader. Um, and he's written a lot of songs that have blessed the entire church. You know, songs like Better Is One Day, Blessed Be Your Name, 10,000 Reasons. We sang one today, Never Once. Um, never Once Did We Ever Walk Alone. Most famous probably for writing The Heart of Worship. So, um, but when Matt first started off in this, in this youth group, Mike had the hardest time trying to get him to do anything. Because you see, Matt Redman only knew how to play three chords and didn't really know how to sing. And so he didn't want to do anything, anything to do with worship. And Mike tried various different ways. Okay, maybe if we got you to play along with this better guitarist or sing with these people, maybe, you know. But it just seemed that the more, time, the more Mike tried to get him to do it, the more excuses Matt could come up with for why he didn't want to do, want, didn't want to lead worship. And so Mike figured out, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a really devious plan. And he got the current worship leader and he said, all right, come over here. And he pulled out a sling and said, okay, I want you to put this, pretend that you hurt your arm playing soccer. Just put it on. And he brought, and so when Matt came to service that day, Mike quickly cornered him and brought the worship leader and said, okay, look, Matt, look, this worship leader is, you know, he's injured. He can't play, he can't lead worship today. So guess what? You're going to have to do it. You are going to have to do it. And Matt still was like, no, I'm not going to do it. I can't do it. I don't know how to do it. I am not trained to do it. And so Mike got his most fake, indignant voice that he could muster. And he said, are you telling me that the people of God today are going to be denied the chance to glorify God and give him the praise that is due his name? Because you're scared? Because you're frightened? And so that's how Matt got stiff-armed into leading worship. And the rest is history. And Mike was quick to point out that it wasn't one of his proudest moments as a youth leader. But the reality is, Mike was right. As long as Matt said no, the Spirit of God was not going to work through him. And we have seen what the Spirit of God has done when he said yes. Matt was stifling the Spirit because he was focused on his inadequacies. And throughout my life in the church, I've heard people say similar things. Oh, I can't teach, even though I've been a Christian for many, many years. I don't know how to relate to children. I don't know how to talk to people. I don't know how to share the gospel. We make excuses all the time based on our presumed failures. 
And I think one of the reasons is because um, while, going to, while seminary is a great thing, I think it's laid a big curse on all of us in the church. And the biggest curse that it's laid is that it's implied that in order for us to be effective ministers, effective leaders, in order for us to um, be witnesses to the gospel, somehow we need to get trained first. We get trained and then we can do the, do the ministry. I've realized that in my own life, I tend to downplay my gifts all the time. Um, when I first started worship leading, which is what I do here, um, people said, you know, I did a good job, but I was so nervous to ever accept a compliment about anything that I just tried to play it down. I hid behind a veil of false humility. I said, you know, that's nothing. Or, you know, I would try and tell them, well, here, all, you said I did a good job, but here are all the mistakes that I did. Um, I didn't sing this song correctly. I missed the chorus over here. By the way, I played some wrong chords over here. Here are all the reasons why you should take back that compliment that you just gave me. <laughs> And it continues through today, you know. Um, I've gotten slightly better, but you know, when people ask me what do I do at Harbor Church, I give probably three answers. If I'm being honest, I'll say, yes, I'm the Minister of Worship and Discipleship at Harbor Church. But my other two um, downplaying answers is that I'm the glorified minstrel of the church, and all I do is play chords in time. <laughs> I'm so quick to downplay what I do. And I'm quick to point out everyone else is obviously better than me. And I've realized that when we play down our gifts and our act, um, when we play down what we do, when we give, play down our gifts and our talents, that's equally as sinful as being a braggart about it. Because when we play down our gifts, we are telling God that the gift that He has already given us through the Holy Spirit, it's not good enough. But God reminds us that He has given us the Holy Spirit and He is able to work above and beyond anything we could ask or imagine. This is the God that said, all you need is five loaves and two fish and I can feed a 5,000. This is the God who asked Samuel, all you need to do is say, speak Lord, I am listening. God can take ordinary things and work them beyond our abilities and comprehension. But He can't do that if we keep saying no to ourselves, we have to say yes. So we say no to ourselves, but I think we also say equally as well, no to other people. And that's because whenever we talk about spiritual gifts, the talk always comes down to what is my gift? And what are my, what is God calling me to do? I remember um, when I was younger in youth group, you know, we took the typical spiritual gifts test at one of our sessions, and it was a lot of fun. It was basically a personality test, you know, like, do you make decisions based on emotion or rationality? You know, one of those kind of tests. And I remember we, at the end of it all, you know, spit out the five top spiritual gifts that you probably exhibit. And we would spend all day asking each other, you know, what do you get, what do you get, what do you get, what do you get? And I realized that we were asking each other not because we were actually interested in any of the other, everyone else's spiritual gifts. We were just trying to compare their gifts with mine so I could see why mine was inherently better. We are obsessed about our own spirituality. We're obsessed about whether our needs are being met. We're obsessed with my personal walk with Jesus Christ and whether that's going fine. And I think that attitude is equally as stifling as saying no to ourselves. It's equally as stifling to the Holy Spirit. Because in this passage, we read that God has called us to be one body with many parts. God has given the manifestation of the Spirit to each of us for the common good. And that means that my gift alone is not going to be good enough to build up the church. Your gift alone is not going to be good enough to build up the church. But we need each other. We need the variety of gifts that is present in this room. In order for the Spirit to move fully in power to bind us as one, we all need to be manifesting the gifts of the Holy Spirit that He's laid in us. And that means we need to be equally invested in bringing out the Holy Spirit's gift 
in other people, in our neighbors, in the people who are sitting next to, as it is about using our own. And what would it look like if we said yes to that? What would it look like if we were a church that was concerned about each other, that we wanted the very, we wanted, we wanted all of us to thrive in our gifts of the Holy Spirit? I know what happened in my life. When I first started worship leading, or when I first started doing anything in music, I did it because I was bored. I didn't do it because I felt um, any strong inclination to have worship. And you know what I was doing? I was the percussionist of the band. And you know, I don't know if you know anything about a band, but when you have a full band, which is the drums, guitars, pianos, saxophone, and all that stuff, the percussionist is pretty much the least essential member of the band. You know, I was basically, if you ever watch SNL, I was Will Ferrell <laughs> saying, we need more cowbell. That was my role in church. I was just doing it for fun. And I, would, I had no inclination to go further than that. But I remember this one person, um, David Tan, he saw something in me. And he said, hey, I see something about the way you lead, the way you worship when you're with the band that I want to bring out. And, it's because, do you, and he asked, you know, do you want to you know, walk alongside me and explore this? Do you want to maybe worship lead with me sometimes and see how you're doing there? And honestly, it's because he said yes to me and to my gift that I'm here right now doing what I do. <clears throat> it's because someone else said yes to me that I do what I do. So how much more if we all said yes to each other? So we say no to ourselves. And we say no to others. But I think finally, the third no that we say is that we say no ultimately to God himself and to God's mission. Because you see, God has given us these gifts, but he's not given us these gifts for our personal spirituality. He's not given these gifts so that um, we can, for our personal growth, but he's given us these gifts to build up his church and to build up his kingdom. And if we say yes to God's mission, if we say yes to God, usually that means that there's no place that God won't take us. It means that we need to be open to the fact that God is going to lead us to places, to jobs, to nations that are entirely foreign to us. Entirely foreign to the ones we have now. If we say to God, you can use my gift for your glory, we may find ourselves in a very strange place. I think of Kathy Jones, who was here a couple, who stood up a couple weeks ago and told us about how um, she's going to Lithuania because she is because she has seriously taken the call of God on her life, and she said that I want to follow you wherever you lead, and I want to use my gift wherever you want me to use that gift. And now she's in Lithuania, teaching English, and being God's light to the nations there. And I, it's a wonderful testament to the power of God. But I wonder if that's also a hindrance to the rest of us. Because we can say, that's really good, Kathy, that you did that. But I'm not. No way. <laughs> no way I'm going to do that. Because when we say no to God and to God's mission, that means we get to maintain the status quo in our lives. It means we get to place our career, our amusements, our family, our hobbies ahead of everything else. We get to place it above God and His call for our life. We get to use our spiritual gifts for our own gain. But the reason we have been given these gifts is to build up the church, to build up and to proclaim the gospel to the nations. In my own life, I've realized that, you know, I said no a lot. When I first started worship leading, I knew. The first time David Tan took me and said, hey, do you want to worship lead with me? And the first time I tried it, I knew. I knew this was what God wanted me to do with my life. But I said no. My walk with him from that point was the walk of Jonah. I ran away at every chance I get. 
I said no first because I wasn't good enough, because I didn't know how to play guitar, and my voice was much worse than it is now. Um, so I said I wasn't good enough. No, God. I said no later on because worship leading is not a legitimate career choice, God. <laughs> I have other things that I need to do. When I was in college, I said no because, God, I hate the church. I hate how ineffective it is. I hate how unjust, unjust it is. So I don't want to do any, have anything to do with it. So no, God. Later on, I, I said no because I knew if I said yes, that meant I'm leaving home. And probably for good. No, God. And finally, you can talk to John. When we first started talking about coming to Harvard Church and working here, he, I said no just because I didn't want to. <laughs> you know, I, I, he told me, like, what do you want to do? And I listed a bunch of other things. And I said, if you really need me, I could do worship if I, you know, if you need me once in a while. But I realized that the more I said no, the more I said no to God's call on my life, the more I started to die inside. The more I started to live without a purpose, the more I started to merely exist. <clears throat> and I realized that when I finally said, okay, I will do this, it's been two years and one month since I said yes again. And I, I mean, you guys haven't known me before then, but let me assure you, it feels like I've come back to life because I've been able to see once again the power of God when he's working in and through me. I've been able to I've been able to see miracles happen amongst all of you. I've been able to see God raise us up as a congregation. I've been able to see so much more about how beautiful and how majestic and how powerful God is. It's because I finally gave in and said yes. And I just want to say, saying to all of you that saying yes to God's mission was the best decision I've made in my life. So as we come to a close, we spent a whole summer talking about what the values of Harbor Church are. And as we move into the fall, the fact is we have transitions coming up. We're talking about maybe getting our first charter members. We're talking about becoming a church. And my plea to you is that, you know, we are one body with many parts. If we are a church that's going to be run primarily by Jana, John, and Jeremy, or even by a few of us, this church is not going to move forward. If we are a church that, if we, if we, if we are a church that will say no to the work of the Holy Spirit in each of our lives, this church is not going to move forward. But if we are a church who says yes, yes to the Spirit of God, yes to His workings, yes to His power amongst us, if we are God, if we are a church that says yes to the mission that God has called us to, if we are a church that is committed to using our God-given gifts to build up His kingdom, then the sky is the limit as to what this church can be. So the question is, will we be a church that says no to ourselves, to others, or to God's mission? Or will we say yes? To sum up what I think is the entire series, I found this quote, and I just want to read that. And then we'll go into communion. Um, so just listen. This is a quote by um, Bob, jo Bob Jeff in his book, Love Does. And he writes, Every day, God invites us on the same kind of adventure. It's not a trip where he sends us a rigid itinerary. He simply invites us. God asks us, what is it he's made us to love? He asks what it is that captures our attention. He asks what feeds that deep, indescribable need of our souls to experience the richness of the world he made. And then leaning over us, he whispers, 
Let's go do that together. Will we say yes to that?